scorn, 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 scorn. Alan Wynn, who art in millennium, hallowed be thy name, thy offloads come, thy pain be numb. In Cardiff, as it is in Swansea, give us this year our grandest slam, and forgive us Jordan Lama's try, as we forgive those who show indiscipline against us. And lead us not into mergers, but deliver us a World Cup, for fine is the Tokyo Stadium, and soon the power and the glory for four years. Amen. Your team winning a Grand Slam should not be a time for jealousy. But as the final whistle blew on Saturday and Cardiff went into rapture, Jonathan Davis got to do exactly what all of Wales wanted to do and hug Alan Wynne Jones before telling him that you love him. Wales were virtually complete on Saturday, shutting a very capable Irish team down comprehensively and firing a warning shot towards Wellington ahead of the World Cup. So, how did Wales see out the Slam and did Ireland really make it as easy as it seemed at times? For most of my life, I've been convinced panic and pessimism are core characteristics of the Welsh, important ingredients in Valley's blood. In fact, the word panic is basically a tribute to the Welsh, coined after the Greek god Pan, who was known for screaming at sheeps on hillsides, a habit which made you famous then, but now makes my Uncle Dave banned from Carmarthenshire. This panic was certainly in the veins of everyone in the Principality, worried we'd let the Grand Slam slip against a team who, lest we forget, were the second best team in the world heading into the game. Everyone, it seemed, except the Welsh team itself. Somewhere in his famously gruelling pre-season camps, Warren Gatlin seems to have taken his team out and drained their blood of any trace of panic, leaving 23 hearts proudly pumping red blood cells, the white cells having been taken out in week three. In past big games, Wales have often needed time to settle themselves, but not so anymore. They were right on right from the start, a perfect kick by Anscombe landing the ball just behind the Irish forwards, meaning North can easily drag Stockdale west, Stocky support unable to help him out without running the long way round first to enter through the gate, by which time it's already too late. Wales then struck early, pulling in England and scoring their only try of the game just 69 seconds in through Hadley Parks. This try was born from analysis and intelligence as much as strength and skill. After a great maul and a great carry by the very show for the rest of Michael Dave, Wales play A phase to get the ball between the posts. This is pre-planned. As I've talked about ad nauseum, Ireland play with a very light backfield with just the greatest used car salesman that never was, Rob Carney, covering kicks. When in a between the posts situation, they slide Carney out to near the wing on the side being attacked, facing inwards so he can sprint in to cover his side of the post with a winger slightly deeper for a cross kick, trusting their main line can turn and cover the rest if a chip happens. A chip does happen. This is a perfect kick by Anscombe. He gets close enough to the defensive line that Aki and Best can't turn in time and then drops the ball onto the inside of his boot, meaning it curves back in a few inches, keeping it as far away from Carney as possible without risking the bounce and hitting the metre at most sweet spot. Ireland's system means they can't cover. By going for the kick after so few phases, Wales negate Ireland's analysis on their attack up until now. After four games of incredible patience, Ireland are ready for another 34 phase epic and prepare for a tight driving game, flooding numbers around the breakdown. Instead, Wales go for their big play right away, catching the Irish off guard and the Kiwi contingent combining for a seven point start. Now, there's a perception that Wales' attack is poor, that if they're to truly compete in Japan, they'll need to up their game and play mental sex rugby, running from anywhere and passing more than Johnny May on Mastermind. It's true that this Six Nations, Wales scored the joint lowest number of tries, just 10 over five games. But Wales won the Grand Slam because in all five of those games, they scored more points than the other team on the field. They won the title without claiming a single try bonus point, without posting a 50 point scoreline, without scoring a retweet bait screamer. They won because what their attack lacked in style, it made up for in smarts. Over the five games, Wales entered the opposition 22 on 25 occasions. On 17 of these, Wales scored points. And of the 8 where they didn't, 2 were because they had tries disallowed, and 2 because they missed a kick at goal. That means Wales manufactured a genuine scoring opportunity on 21 out of 25 trips to the 22. When they get near the line, Wales score points. When you're that good at taking chances, it doesn't really matter how many you score, because you know you'll always have more. They've been doing this since the Argentina tour, their attack isn't poor, they've just learned to win games without having to put the ball on the floor. At the other end of the pitch, Wales shut the door. As clinical as attack has been, this has very much been a championship title built on defence. As such, Wales are happy to play for territory and surrender the ball because they know they can hold an opposition out. Come the 81st minute, Wales has held Ireland to nil for the first time since 1963. And whilst they did eventually let Lama the living sidestep in for a try, it was a monumental effort against a side whose whole thing is wearing oppositions down. For most teams, dealing with Ireland is as aggravating and tiring as playing parlour games with Boris Johnson. It's defending the endless dawdle, 
a team that just keeps the ball until you make a mistake. Ireland's play is extremely structural, sticking to a system designed to slowly disorganise an opposition. However, Wales's greatest strength is remaining organised. Off kick return, off turnover, Wales snap into shape quicker than anyone else and hold that shape no matter what. Over the whole tournament, Wales' defence has only really been undone twice, once by an incredible set play by Scotland and once by Italy who were facing a Welsh team with more changes than David Bowie would have managed if only he'd finished each word of the course instead of stuttering. The only man with carte blanche to break Schmidt's system is fly half juggle pen sex rash, who is trusted to do what he likes and that almost paid off with Alan's best chance of the game. In a bit of improvisation that I can't show you because the cameras are off, sex fan ignores protocol and plays a perfect cross kick to Stockdale who almost scores but for a brilliant tackle by the man with a service station for a name, Hadley Parks. However, that's about where Job Hunt Sex Queen's highlights reel ends for the day. As the reigning World Player of the Year showed us his one real weakness hasn't gone away after all. It seemed last year that Sex Lump had calmed down massively since Ron Nogara left the country, but it's turned out these last seven weeks he's just as capable of a full-on purple face meltdown these days as he's ever been. And the angrier jailmate Sex Penny got, the worse juggernaut Sex Wanger got. Toys were landing as far away from the pram as Sex Slam's passes were from their targets. When he's calm, he's the best 10 in the world, but when he gets under his skin enough, he's, and I'm not going to dress this up, a pile of shit. His second half was a catalogue of errors, where it was just walking up to him and ordering a knock-on whenever they wanted. And the problems weren't limited to sex yodel. Even when watching the game for the second, third, fourth, fifth, twenty-seventh time, I forgot a number of Ireland's supposed big game players were on the pitch. Whilst it's unfair to criticise Stockdale for failing to find the ball, Conor Murray failed to find the pace, and Peter Omani failed to find anything, the glass shithouse becoming even more invisible than usual as he made one tackle over 80 minutes. A lot of pundits are putting the distance of Wales' win down to how poor Ireland were, which has become something of a theme over the last year. However, it surely can't be a coincidence that over Wales' 14 game winning streak, virtually every opposition team they play seems to leave saying, that was the worst we've played in years. Because these are being looked at as 14 one off rather than in context, there's a perception that this Wales team is almost lucky, winning a Grand Slam after facing five teams misfiring on the day. You can buy that once or twice, but 14 times? In a row? There's only two possible explanations. Either Wales are actually very good and specialise in disrupting and frustrating the opposition, or it's divine intervention and God is Welsh. Personally, I believe it's both and Alwyn Jones is all the proof we need. Which beautifully brings us on to the man himself. There was something very special about the way Alan Wynn went about his work on Grand Slam Day. Suffering what has proven to be a season-ending injury in the first 10 minutes before going on to top just about every stat on the sheet. And not only did he rack up the numbers, the incredible thing about Alan Wynn is his engine. When Josh Adams broke the line late on, look who's the first up in support, busting everything to get there. When Sex Cow puts his kick out on the full, Alan Wynn sprints up to the halfway line ready to get going. He's the guy everyone on the field wants to follow. Standards are set so high by him, and now it's up to everyone else to meet them. And the guy who spends an enviable amount of time with his arm around Alan Wynn did just that, with Adam Beard having possibly the game of his still undefeated Wales career so far. Crinkling the Irish Moor with Charterissi inefficiency, and working his way around the park in a manner of which his captain would be proud. In fact, that's true of all 23 players. Jonathan Davis' sentiment wasn't unique. This Wales team is incredibly close. Much of the squad is going on holiday together next week, Right after spending two months together all day every day, Wales' own hype machine Rob Evans said there isn't one man in the squad he wouldn't run for a brick wall for, and knowing what Rev is like I'm inclined to believe he means that literally. Maybe they didn't win it playing with the kind of mental sex rugby flair that neutrals love to watch, but even divorced from my eternal devotion to all things Alan Wynn, there's something wonderful about seeing a group of players win a Grand Slam playing for each other. This Welsh team may have scored based on intelligence, they may have defended based on fitness, they may have scrummaged based on muscle and they might have kicked based on skill, but they won based on heart. And to that, I say, Amen. And now for some parish notices. Thank you to everyone that's put something in the collection tin that's allowed you know, to rebuild the church roof, um, by which I mean thank you to everyone that's supported the channel on Patreon and allowed me to make the videos as quickly and as, as, as I have. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for watching that. That is unfortunately for most people the end of the Six Nations. For me, it means I get a nap. So quite looking forward to that once I've finished my tea. Um, and also thank you to everyone that took part in the Squid Rugby Super Rugby. The first time I've done this, I was amazed at how many people took part. 1,174 of you decided to take part in that. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Now, people that have been watching all the way through the Six Nations will know the top of that league, the entire way, in line to win a yellow cap from Super Brew themselves. They're going to send it out to the winner. Top of the league in Taiwan has been the Elite Biscuit Farmers Vivid Oysters, who have just been 
cruising through top round one round two round three round four and now i'm delighted to say that round five where the one that really matters where the winner is crowned i'm delighted to say the elite biscuit farmers vivid oysters have slipped down to fourth and unfortunately missed out i'm i'm, I'm really sorry um it's slightly unfair but there's been a team floating around you know that top 15 maybe somewhere there or thereabouts and in the last week timed their run like a great marathon runner and pounced up the top and so the champions of the inaugural squidge rugby super brew league are grent imahara's tremendous titans who are tremendous indeed and uh, congratulations to grant the coach someone from super brew will send you the cap soon enough thank you very much to everyone that took part um also mentioned to Tony Sneaks, Hearty Parrots, who again flowed there and about in the end finished second. Very close, just three points off the title. That's just a handful of missed tackles or, you know, one tries difference. And then the Felching Fowls, who again, there and thereabouts have slid up and finished third. And unlucky again to the Elite Biscuit Farmers Vivid Oysters for just, just missing out. However, that does now bring us to the end of the Six Nations. So thank you very much everyone that stuck with the channel over the course of the last two months. Uh, it's been fantastic. I'm going to be going back to the series on all the teams in the World Cup and more rugby stuff beyond that. So thank you very much. But in the meantime, I'm going to drink this tea and then have a nap. I'll see you later. Bye. Oh, it's just another Saturday. 